Hi, Karen. It's so good hey. to be here. I missed yeah. it at you. It's like we were I, every week. We were like in it. This was cool, <laughs> stressful. We had a little thing going, but I uh, I was winding down from work. And so I had a lot going on in May. My last day at the University of Minnesota was May 7th, I think. And I've since relocated. So now I am a research fellow at Georgetown University Ooh. Law Center. Okay, they could. They, God bless them for having you because they, oh. they got a real one right now, oh, uh, Georgetown. Y'all are lucky. Um, <laughs> but you're still following and still tweeting, I see, uh, with what's happening. I think, you know, again, we had uh, former mayor of Flint, Karen Weaver, on. We tend to have a limited capacity to pay attention to a lot of things, which is human. So I'm not wagging my finger at anyone. But it's our job to continue to, to have these conversations because these problems aren't going away. So Flint's water is still jacked up. So we're going to keep talking about it. And Derek Chauvin probably will get an appeal. <laughs> but what does that mean, Angie Porter? What's, what's going to happen? Yes. So there, is a, there, is, there are two things happening with Chauvin. Well, actually, we should say three. There's three things going on with him specifically right now. The first most immediate thing is that his sentencing is coming up on June 25th. So there have been memoranda submitted to the court from both sides, from prosecution and from the defense attorney, Eric Nelson, arguing about what his sentence should be. Ultimately, is the court's decision, or the judge, rather, um, about what his sentence will be. But prosecution has asked for 30 years. Eric Nelson has asked for time served. I saw that. I said, is he out of his damn mind? I said, is he out of his damn time served? Is he out of his damn mind? Like to have the the arrogance, but he's the defense attorney. So he's going to ask for the most ridiculous. He's got to do that for his client. You're absolutely right. I think, you know, that's sort of the expectation and you just make those outlandish arguments. I don't know how much he really believes in them, but the thing that's happening in parallel is what you mentioned before, this potential appeal. But before you appeal, you have to do what are called post-conviction motions. So he's gonna make his arguments to this current judge, Judge Pete Cahill, um, see what happens with that. And then if those arguments are disregarded, they'll appeal. So it'll have, you know, we'll see these same arguments come up, but he basically threw the kitchen sink at Judge Cahill. All the arguments you could think of came up in those post-conviction motions. And he's arguing essentially that there were so many errors that happened during trial that we need a new trial entirely. Well, one of the errors of the, the video that we watched, nine minutes and 29 seconds, the, everything that we saw in that video, was that an error that, where he <laughs> right. literally killed a man on video? Right. That, right, right. You make a okay. good point. The thing is, it is so outlandish, and I've you've seen me on Twitter, I'm sure. You know, it's all a stretch. But what I want people to understand is the arguments Eric Nelson is making, um, they are based in legal precedent. So there is a whole storied history of cases in Minnesota where similar arguments have been raised. And he's banking on the fact that you have to follow the pattern as a court. You, if you entertain that argument back in 1970, you have to entertain it now. So all of these outlandish, seemingly outlandish arguments do have a foundation in some court case somewhere. All right, realistically, because again, I want us to always be prepared and, and you know, they took down, they're, they're taking down the George Floyd Memorial it's yeah. not even been two years. I mean, the man was so mm, I talked to Dr. Carr about this. So I again I, I try to temper my emotions by saying that the memorial doesn't matter as much as laws being changed, policing being changed in this country. You know, to pay homage to George Floyd's life would mean we get some things done throughout this country as it relates to policing our, our black bodies in this country. So but what what's what's happening on the streets? I know you're no longer in Minnesota, but before you left, what were they yeah. saying about this memorial coming down and yeah. what does it mean? Well, 
that space was a really powerful space. I went down there in the early days to pay my respects. And what struck me about George Floyd Square, it was the whole intersection, it was blocked off. Uh, what struck me was how communal it was. It was really, in some respects, an African space. It was an indigenous space. And it was an indignant space saying, y'all can come up in here. Police, y'all got to stay out there. So, you know, to me, it just was a symbolic setting for resistance. And they knew at some point it would come to a head, I think. When are we going to battle for this space? Now, there were movements to make it permanent, turn it into sort of like a uh, pedestrian mall memorial, formal memorial situation. They even had a mock cemetery set up. I'm sure you've seen a lot of the photos. From what I heard, this happened while I was moving. They went in there at the crack of dawn under cover of night, 4 a.m., and cleared it out. Now, that says a lot to me. <laughs> that says to me, y'all didn't even want to negotiate with the community or have your listening sessions that you so love. Um, you didn't even want to be forthright about the date certain that this would be taken down. You had to be shady and go in in the middle of the night. And I think that's the piece that is particularly insulting, dehumanizing, upsetting. I don't think it's the fact that they said, okay, people, we need to take this down at some point. Um, it's the way they went about it. Now, that, uh, rewind a few years. This is the city of Prince Rogers Nelson, right? So when Prince made transition, a lot of people went out to Paisley Park. They left their vigils, they left letters, including me. You know, we all left stuff on the fence and it was looking sort of similar to George Floyd Square. I don't know how they went about taking that down, but they memorialized every piece of paper. They, that stuff is in a vault and it's being showcased as part of a museum, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm like, wow. this was such a historic event. George Floyd's death and all that has happened since. The city of Minneapolis, I think, should be ashamed about the way they went about this because all of that should be memorialized. We should be seeing that stuff in museums around the world, mm -hmm. not just Minnesota, not just Minneapolis, not just the US. So those are the things I'm thinking about when I saw that story. And it, to me, just was another assertion of white dominance and white supremacy to say, you know what? Uh, okay, this is how we handled Prince over here. It was a different municipality. That was Chanhassen, Minnesota, but still, this is how we handled Prince over here, real respectful. <laughs> uh, but for this crime, this murder, we're just gonna bulldoze right through whatever uh, attempt y'all made at memorializing or healing or uh, recognizing the death of a person. We're just gonna bulldoze right through it at 4 a.m. I think about the um, the rubble left after the firebombing of Tulsa Greenwood, um, the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And those were spaces that were owned by people because I was I was also thinking, I'm like, well, the people don't own. It's almost like gangs owning blocks and and, and commandeering blocks that they don't own and then fighting over turf that they don't own. This was not a space. This was a public space. This was city owned space so they could do whatever they want, which also to me and should engender, inspire people to have ownership. You know, mm -hmm. if we're going to have something, then we should have ownership. But I, even when we have ownership, like in Greenwood, like in Wilmington, doesn't mean that people can't bulldoze through it when they <laughs> feel froggy. Oh, absolutely. So, and, and, and Karen, when you add the indigenous angle in there, you know, they looking at it, and that's a powerful presence in Minneapolis, by the way, the, the indigenous communities, the Dakota, the Lakota, they looking at this like, y'all, none of y'all own any of this. <laughs> this is our space. So do what you want to do with your so social structure. Sorry, that's my dad. <laughs> do what you want to do with your social structure, but y'all don't own this anyway. And we've come here to support our brethren with this memorial. So, you know, I think their angle would be similar to what you're saying, but a little different. 
866-801-8255. Angie Porter, June 25th is the day we're going to be leaning in to see what the sentencing is going to be. Right. How much time before the appeal? And then what can we expect? Because again, this is this is a landmark case. This probably is going to be a landmark case, even though they don't want y'all studying Plessy versus Ferguson and Dred Scott and stuff anymore yeah. because of the, it, it hurts white people's feelings. But this is <laughs> this is going to be one of those cases I think may be studied. Um, what should we be paying attention to after after June 25th? Well, certainly the appeal that will inevitably come if he's sentenced to anything, anytime. Um, that length of time will likely be appealed. All of these arguments we've seen in the post-conviction motion, if that's denied, will likely be appealed. I don't have my notes in front of me that are probably lost in a moving truck somewhere, but, <laughs> but I believe it's 60 days from the decision on the post-conviction motion that they have time to appeal. They could appeal at any time, really. So we need to be looking for that. We also should have our eyes on the federal case that's happening in tandem with all of this. Um, no dates are set in that case, but it is happening. And Chauvin has two federal cases. So he has the case regarding George Floyd, but also the one regarding who they're calling Juvenile One, the 14 year old who he used very similar use of force on as he did with George Floyd. So he has a lot going on. Do we, we don't know the, the child's name because he's he was a I child. Don't I don't okay. know. I don't I don't think that person has come out, but you know, I'd have to check. But in the court records, that's been totally concealed. Now J. Alexander Kung Kang, uh Thomas Lane and Tao Tao, Tao Tao. Tu Tao, uh, yeah. Tu Tao. Uh the three officers that helped hold George Floyd down while Derek Chauvin uh, choked him to death and, and squeezed the life out of his neck. Um, their, their trials are coming up as well. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that state court trial, which I think last we talked, we were expecting that to happen in August or September. That's been pushed back to March, 2022. Then oh, wow. Yeah, so that's that's been delayed. Wow, wow. Yeah, so I know. And what, and what know. we know is every month fewer people care. So this is this is crazy because last year everybody was Black Lives Matter. Now the majority of people in this country don't even care about Black Lives anymore. And that's a poll that just came out. Uh, they're they're thinking it's you know not a thing wow. to get behind. Well, and this is common knowledge in the court system <laughs> that if you put more time between the day that the incident occurred and the trial, heads will cool. People's emotions will be less high. And I think that rationale was even articulated in the judge's decision to delay this. Of course, he attributed it to a couple of things, one being the federal case, but that federal case is not happening anytime soon. I mean, it's ongoing, they're doing pretrial stuff, but that federal trial doesn't even have a date set. So one of the main rationales Judge Cahill articulated was we need to put a little time because of all the media wow. and we need to put a little time between these. Um, and that flew, that's, well, now we're looking in March. And as we know, Karen, we're probably gonna endure Plenty, unfortunately, in this country, plenty of high profile killings in the space between them. So, you know, a lot of people, particularly white folk who don't have to think about these things every day, they, you know, they're going to be like, oh, George Floyd, that thing was settled a long time ago. We don't care. And those are going to be the same white people drawn as jurors in that That's right. trial, the other three. 